Right, just an update on this iPod uh, Nano 6 display. As you can see, I've actually got it uh, displaying stuff now. Um, it's hooked up to a little lattice um, FPGA dev board, just feeding data in uh, through an RS485 interface for speed. Um, this lattice board has actually got an FTDI chip on there, but it might be a bit of a pain to get at the serial data without fighting the um, FPGA programming stuff, so it's just easy to feed it in through an external link. This is feeding data in at about 6 megabits a second. And that's really the limiting factor on the display. I mean, if you can feed it data fast enough, you can actually get 60 frames a second on this thing. So apart from the FPGA board, there's just a uh, DC to DC I'm using for the backlight. It was just quicker and easier than making up a proper backlight supply. I just uh, happened to have a 15 volt DC DC on the shelf, so I just used that and the resistor to generate the. Um, it's about 14 volts that the um, backlight needs. It's four white LEDs in series. And you can see some uh, grisly details of the, the setup. I would say this is the. Um, uh, breakout board and I just soldered a few of these um, turn pin socket contacts at each end so I can mess around with different resistor values coily springs so I can actually get the scope probe in with a nice sort of heavy ground so I can get a good grounded um, scope connection to see what's going on and these are the uh, waveforms you've got the uh, the low speed signaling which is that this, the, um, this signal here so these two differential lines need to go down at separate times to get it into the right mode and then the actual differential data um, I've had a quick play to see how slowly this will run it runs okay at 24 megahertz but it was doing odd things at 12 megahertz now it could be that that's something to do with um, my setup or there could be some fundamental timeouts or something in the interface I don't really have time to look at look at it any further at the moment but I will actually have a look at that to see how slowly it can be run because if it's I mean, 24 megahertz is within in the realms of what you could probably do with with a bit of creativity on something like an SPI port, you still need to generate the DDR data. But there's probably ways you could do that. Um, it might even be as simple as taking the SPI clock and just dividing it by two, and uh, just adding a simple multiplexer or something. So um, that's potentially doable. But say so what I don't yet know is how slow you can run it and have it still work. Um, the display does have onboard memory, and the refresh rate isn't dependent on the um, data clock rate here. So um, if you can clock it slowly, you can in principle, you know, give it images slowly. So so um, when I've got time I'll, I'll delve into that a little bit more. Right, the method I used for generating the, this data, um, I had a, I used a differential output stage in the FPGA to generate the high speed data. Well I think at these speeds you might even be able to get away with just using two, um, you know, two standard logic levels um, inverting. Um, these are at 1.8 volt levels, so to reduce those down to the LVDS levels um, I used a resistive divider. So those are the outputs for the, to the display. Um, so that in LVDS mode, um, these were I think 220 and these are 47 ohms. Um, and these pins I took to a couple of other outputs in the FPGA. So there's a total of four outputs. Um, this LVDS driver also has a, a tri-state enable. So to generate, basically you have the high level, the low level, and then the LVDS level. So at the high level the LVDS driver is off and these two are both high. Um, the two lines you need to get to take low at slightly different times. So these go low in turn to pull the line low and then um, by just turning the LVDS driver on that then gets it to this level to actually produce the LVDS data. Um, so that was all relatively straightforward. I did actually use the, um, the FPGA did actually have a, um, a DDR uh, cell in the IO block which I use but again at these speeds I, I don't think you'd really need that I think you could do that with some fairly, fairly simple logic and so uh, when I get time I'll have a play around to see how slow I can get this running because it may be feasible to actually run this um, with an SPI peripheral or something a bit simpler but um, th this, this seems to do the job quite fine I've, yeah, I've had this running at about 66 megahertz the, uh, the iPod runs at 110 meg fairly unnecessary unless you really want to get the absolute maximum frame rate out of it but uh, once you get all the levels right, you need to do this on the clock and the data line. Incidentally, the um, the clock line has to go go through this procedure to get into low power mode. I was stuck for quite a long time because I didn't realise that until I sort of reread the spec and had another look at what the iPod was doing. I was really focusing on the data, but the clock you actually need to do this as well to actually get it to um, start working properly. This is a Lattice uh, Mac X02 FPGA. I was sort of looking around at what was available. Um, one of the real pains is that they don't really seem to do many FPGAs in small packages that aren't BGA. Almost all of them go down to 100 pin, this is actually 144 pin QFP which is a bit silly because it's about the same size as the display itself. Um, they do a 100 pin but they also do uh, one in a 32 QFN 
um, which might be interesting. At the moment I'm using actually using the memory in here to do a line buffer, so I'm sort of downloading the serial data into the line buffer and then blasting it out to the um, LCD. But one thing which I think might be interesting is you can now get very cheap but quite big SPI serial flash chips. You can get a like 256 megabit chip for um, about sort of two quid or so, and those do actually have a DDR interface which will go up to sort of 66 megahertz. So I think it will be very viable to actually stream data directly from an SPI flash into this display with almost no additional logic or memory. You just need to sort of generate the uh, those voltage levels and the right timing. So, I thought, so you could certainly do it with a fairly simple CPLD. So you could do like a little low um, low capacity still frame or video player I think quite easily, you know, sort of store a few hundred frames in SPI flash and actually have quite a nice simple system for driving. I mean, this is actually a very nice little display. It's say 240 by 240. Yeah, quite very nice resolution, quite good color rendering. The iPod drives it as 18 bit per pixel. I haven't tested to see whether it actually displays 24 bit or not. It's a 24 bit interface, but the iPod only gives it 18. Um, I haven't really had a chance to generate some test data to try and uh, figure, out, figure that out. But then, they're really cheap, you can get these from China for about three and a half quid delivered and they're sort of nice and thin. They, um, in the iPod they come fairly well bonded to the uh, multi-touch sensor and I think it would actually be quite difficult to replace one on its own but um, you can buy just the LCDs on their own, they're quite a lot cheaper than the combination of the LCD and the uh, multi-touch thing. And this is what they, they look like, um, they're sort of r r very thin. Um, you've got this little flex, there's a flex on the side which will actually bend at 90 degrees and then you've got a reasonable length of um, cable to this connector which I mentioned in the previous video is an obtainable connector so it is sort of quite viable to use it but I'm just sort of thinking a little board on the back with like a 32 QFN FPGA or CPLD and um, a serial flash could make quite a nice little um, sort of video display thing which I might have a play around with as when I've got time. This uh, board it's a really cheap it's about 20 quid um, board from uh, Lattice for their XO2 devices and what I like about it is it's very basic it's just got just what you need and nothing else you've got voltage regulators you've got the JTAG interfaces implemented with an FTDI chip so you don't need to mess about with a separate programmer you've got all the pins broken out and I see they have actually all these pin breakouts have been wired as differential pairs if you want to use fast LVDA signals and they've got op optional um, termination resistors. The other good thing is there's plenty of grounds in there. One problem with some sort of very simple boards is they don't put enough grounds to get good signal integrity. And you know, the nice thing about this board is that, you know, it's cheap enough to basically treat it as being expendable. So you know, you've got no worries about just soldering stuff wherever you want. Um, again, unlike a lot of other low-end boards, you can access all the different so you set up all the different I/O bank voltages. Um, there's some resistors underneath you just take to connect each I/O bank to the 3.3 volt supply. So you can just disconnect that and connect the I/O banks to different voltages. So for here for the LCD, I'm running 1.8 volts. The other neat feature, for example, all the supplies go through one ohm resistors, so you can use that as a current sense to um, measure the actual current through. Um, to each supply rail, because when you're doing an FPA, FPGA project, the power consumption can be quite hard to figure out and, and estimate because it's so dependent on the clock frequencies and how much logic's being used internally. So it's quite useful to be able to just test, yeah, exactly what I'm doing here, test just the bits of stuff that you need, measure all the current, so you, you've then got an inf enough information to go straight into a, doing a proper PCB with, you know, with fairly high degree of confidence that things going to work. It's really the bare minimum, just some LEDs, the little few, few pads for breakout, and that, that's really it. It did actually, it has got a footprint for a surface mount oscillator. Um, I think it was a bit silly to do it that way, because they do actually have space, they, they would have had space to put you know, pins for um, a dual oscillator, because the one thing you may want to do is put different oscillator frequencies on there and it's a bit silly to have to solder it on um, when they do actually have the PCB area available for um, a dill one but um, so apart from that it's quite a nice little board and I think you know, it's a pity that other manufacturers don't do just really simple cheap boards like this to so say there's a few there but the, most of the ones I've seen yeah, you know, they either they don't break, break all the pins out or you can't access different IO bank voltages or so on this is you know, one of the best sort of low-end boards in terms of you know, they've actually thought well what, pe what do people really need to evaluate this chip and just sort of provide that at a, you know, a very cheap cost, so I quite like that. And when I was looking at these you know, FPGAs to use for this, um, I was actually quite impressed by these devices. There's a fair range, I say, apart from a bit of a hole in the pin count um, family, um, but there's a few nice features. One is they've there's versions with onboard 
um, core voltage regulator so you can run them off a single 3.3 volt supply. Um, the other thing is they've got onboard flash so you don't need an external configuration memory on. You can use one if you want to but you don't need to so literally for a three volt, th three point, single 3.3 volt supply you've got potentially a complete working system. They've also got an on-chip oscillator as well. Um, it's not super accurate. I think from memory it's something like 5% but it's switchable from a fair frequency range. It's something like 2, two meg to 200 meg in sort of, uh, I think there's a couple of dozen, dozen different steps. So, you know, for a complete working system, you've got pretty much everything on one on that um, single chip. So um, they're quite nice. And their pricing's fairly reasonable. And the nice thing compared to people like Xilinx is you can go to DigiKey and actually get all the quantity pricing. They've got plenty of stock, whereas Xilinx seems to do this bizarre sort of supported pricing nonsense. So you can't actually find out what they cost without talking to distrib distributors and all this sort of nonsense where um, that just seems to sort of take a much more straightforward approach to things. Um, also had a quick look at this, this is the Lattice Ice 40 which are super super low cost uh, FPGAs. One of the reasons I didn't use it for this um, was that firstly they don't have enough memory on it and I think eventually for the thing this has been designed into I don't yet know if I'm going to need memory or not but also it doesn't have any PLL so it's um, a bit harder to mess around with different clock frequencies. Um, but these are also quite nice, and again, this is a really simple, really cheap um, board for these. Um, I think they've broken most of the pins out on this. Um, there's a sort of few touch panels, and so on. These, I think, these are actually um, the original silicons made by a company called Silicon Blue, which I believe Lattice took over. Um, but they are aimed at very low cost, low power. These are the low end ones. Of these are about a pound. Um, so there's some quite nice, interesting stuff where you don't need a huge amount of logic. It's probably arguable whether that's a CPLD or an FPGA. I mean, they're becoming very blurred these days, the distinction between the two. But um, that's quite an interesting little chip as well. One thing I noticed um, when I was playing around with this, um, because the uh, control chip on this flex is partly exposed to light because the flex is a bit transparent, I was taking a uh, photo of it when the flash fired, it uh, wiped the chip out. The chip actually needed a hard reset to um, get it back again. So that, that's actually quite common for chips to be sensitive to flash. Um, another situation on the old um, window D proms where if you fire a flash gun near them it doesn't erase them but it does temporarily corrupt the data that's being read out of them. So if you've got a system that's running off these things without adequate um, shielding, even a paper label isn't necessarily good enough, you fire a flash gun and um, you crash the system. So you don't often get chips that are actually exposed, you know, that are sufficiently exposed to light for it to be an issue, but when you do, um, it does have quite a significant effect.